fellow astrophiles, this is Pat Cosgrove, and I'd like to welcome you to Cosgrove's Cosmos. Today, we'll be talking about my latest imaging project, which now completes the last bit of data that I captured during the last imaging cycle. The object that we'll be dealing with today is NGC 6888, the Crescent Nebula. This is the result of 12.9 hours of integration of hydrogen alpha and oxygen-3 narrowband data, as well as some RGB broadband data, which will also be used by the project. Also, in this segment, I'm going to be experimenting with a new way of sharing the high-level image processing strategy that I use for this project. While I do document a detailed step-by-step -step processing walkthrough, sometimes I feel like you can get lost in the trees and not see the forest. So what I'm trying to do now is present a new way to give you the big picture of how the flow of processing would happen, and then zoom in and give you just enough detail to get an appreciation for it without getting lost in the weeds. Of course, backing this up is the complete image processing walkthrough that's posted on the website. So without further ado, let's get started. The Crescent Nebula is another great target from the constellation of Cygnus. And it seems like I've been shooting an awful lot of targets from this region of the sky recently, since it's been so well positioned for me. This particular object is an emission nebula whose formation has been associated with a wolf Rayart star, WR136. This is not the first time I've shot this target. The first time I shot this image was in 2019, shortly after I started my astrophotography journey. This was a 1.6 hour integration with a one-shot color camera. You can see the results of that image here. About a year later, in 2020, I shot a 2.3 hour integration. This time, the first, one of the first images that I used with my new mono camera at the time. Uh, this was imaged with uh, hydrogen alpha and oxygen-3 bicolor image and narrow band. The current image was shot with my astrophysics 130 millimeter f8.35 uh, EDT APO refractor, which has a ZWO next generation uh, ASI 2600 MM Pro mono camera mounted on it. These are carried by my Ioptron CEM60 mount, which has always been a real solid performer for me. This combination is my most powerful combination, and this is what I often use when I'm trying to reshoot an object and see if I've moved the football a little bit further down the field. For this video, I've created a one-page summary of the image processing strategy that I'm using to process the image. In this one page, I hope to give you that big picture view of what the basic flow is for the processing uh, and how the pieces relate to one another. Sometimes this is easy to miss when you're looking at a detailed step-by-step -step walkthrough. The other thing I'm gonna to try to do with this is once I've introduced this, I'm gonna take pieces of that diagram and I'm going to present a video summary of what that flow looks like. And I'll be doing that by presenting the image as it appears in various processing stages and watch how it evolves as we go through the high-level strategy. This will try not to get bogged down in a lot of the detail of how each element is processed in precise ways. That's covered by my website. But this should give you an idea of what the big picture is, the basic flow, kind of an idea for how the images evolve and merge to create the final product. Um, again, this is a bit of an experiment. I don't know how well this will work, but I would be interested in your feedback. And even if I fail, maybe I'll learn something in the process and find a way to improve it. Data capture occurred over four clear moonless nights, which ended on September 2nd. Um, the goal here was to primarily capture hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. As you look at the figures on the screen here, you can see that a lot more hydrogen alpha was captured than oxygen-3. And the reason for that will become evident in a few moments when we look at the blink data. In addition to the narrowband data, RGB data was captured, at least a small amount of it, 
uh, only 10 subs at 90 seconds for each of the primary colors. Uh, the goal here was to have some data where I could uh, extract some RGB stars for use in the final image. We are now looking at the hydrogen alpha blink data, uh, and this data is pretty clean. Now we're looking at the oxygen-3 blink data, and you can see that uh, high thin clouds came through, uh, attenuating quite a bit of the frame seen here, which caused me to eliminate more than I would have liked. Now that we've captured our data and pre-processed it, we have our HA, oxygen-3, red, green, and blue master linear images. We can start our post-processing. I wanted a way of conveying the flow that I was going to use for this particular image, so I created this chart. This chart is a very high-level chart, but it shows how images flow through the linear processing domain, the nonlinear processing domain, the shift over to the starless processing arena, and then finally how things are brought together to create the final image. Um, and what I'd like to do here is to highlight certain areas uh, of this chart and then talk about some of the detail of what happens to the images uh, as we engage in our processing exercise. So let's start here on the chart. We'll look at our hydrogen alpha and our oxygen 3 image and we'll look at how we process that till we get to the point where we have the starless version of that image. Here we have our master linear images. At this point We've done a uh, dynamic crop to get rid of the ragged out, outer edges, um, and dynamic background extraction has been done. The next step is to do some slight um, noise reduction, and for this I'm going to use the noise exterminator run with a value of 0.5, uh, and this will be applied to both of these images. The next step is to take these images into the nonlinear domain. I did this by using the screen transfer function where I adjusted each to get the look I wanted and to make sure both images were balanced with one another. This was transferred to the histogram tool to make it permanent. At that point, the images were combined in the HOO uh, configuration uh, and this was done using the channel combination tool. Here we see our first look at it. Um, the image looks a little cold, so it looks like I didn't get the balance between the images just the way I wanted it. So our first task will be to go in and adjust that. To adjust the balance a bit, I went in with the Curves Transformation tool, uh, selected the red layer, and uh, just boosted the uh, signal on that a little bit so that red was a little bit more predominant in the image because we know the background is primarily hydrogen alpha, and I wanted to bring that out. This version of the HOO color image is looking pretty, re pretty reasonable now. Um, the color balance isn't too bad. I can see the oxygen-3 shell around the nebula. I can see the nice backdrop, and I can see some nice hydrogen alpha within the nebula. At this point, I'm going to shift to the starless domain, where we can get a lot more aggressive in the kinds of processing we can do. Now we want to create our, a starless version of our HOO color image. This is done by using StarNet2, and the result is looking pretty good. This is a foundation that we can use for uh, more aggressive processing, but this particular image will close out this sequence, and we'll go back and explore another. Now that we've created our color HOO starless image, let's take a look at the luminance image. First off, we don't have a luminance image, so we're going to have to create that, and then we're going to get that to the same point where we end up with a starless version of the luminance image. Just as with our last sequence, we start with the master images for the hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3. We're going to use these as the building blocks for our luminance image. 
if we had more, if we had another channel, I could use image integration to create the luminance image. But in this case, we're going to create a synthetic luminance by doing some kind of linear blend of these images. So in order to decide what that blend should be, let's explore a couple of combinations and see if something pops out as useful. This first version is a 75% hydrogen alpha added to a 25% uh, oxygen 3 image. Uh, in this particular image we see the HA data very clearly but we're really not seeing much of the oxygen 3 shell which we really have to represent so this is probably not the best answer. With this image we've blended 25 percent hydrogen alpha with 75 percent oxygen 3. With this combination you can clearly see the oxygen 3 shell but the spikes that are near the t seen at the top and of the hydrogen alpha um, image and one of its most interesting features is starting to get less visible so this is probably not the right blend either this version of the image is a 50 50 weighting between our two starting images uh, this seems to work pretty well I can see the uh, spiky detail from the hydrogen alpha near the top, but I can also see the oxygen 3 shell. So I guess an equal weighting is probably our best idea. So using pixel math, we'll create our luminance image from that particular blend. After creating our synthetic luminance image, uh, we'll do a deconvolution on it, and then we'll do a noise reduction cycle on it. And at that point, we're going to be ready to jump over to the nonlinear domain. And that's what we have here. I use the screen transfer function in a custom mode to get the look I wanted and use the uh, histogram tool to um, blend that into the image to create our first nonlinear luminance image. Since most of the processing I want to do on this luminance image is going to be in the starless domain, we're going to go there directly. Uh, using Starnet 2, we've created our first starless version of the luminance image. We'll be using the luminance image to carry all the sharpness uh, and detail that we can into the final image. In order to enhance that right now, I'm going to use the local histogram equalization with a radius of 64, a contrast limit of 2, and an amount of um, about 0.3, uh, and an 8-bit histogram. Um, and this will act to enhance the fine level detail that you can see in the nebula. While applying this tool, I only wanted to affect the nebula region and not the background. To do that, I created a nebula mask, which has been applied here. We'll talk a little bit later about how we created that mask. Now we're going to apply the LHE tool again to the image, um, but this time we're going to be targeting the enhancement of larger scale features. So we're going to be using a radius of 370 pixels, a contrast limit of 2. The amount will still be limited to 0 0.3, but we're going to shift over to using a finer resolution 12-bit histogram. Um, once you do this, you can see that the Oxygen 3 shell has much better definition. And once again, we're using the nebula mask so that the actions of the tool are focused in the region of the nebula alone. And finally, we're going to bring out the detail a little bit more by applying an MLT sharpening pass to it. So it'll just crispen up the image. This again will be restricted to just the area of the nebula since we want to sharpen that detail without necessarily sharpening the lower signal areas in the background. Um, in a second here, we'll show the actual panel on MLT that I use so you get an idea of the parameters that were applied. And here is the MLT panel, and you can see the sharpening parameters that were uh, used for this particular image. So now we've created our starless image for both the uh, synthetic luminance and for our color HOO image. It's time to go back and make sure we have some RGB stars we can add in. So let's take a look at that path. We're going to start with our master linear red, green, and blue images. At this point, these images have been cropped and dynamic background extraction has been applied. Um, now we're ready to take our next steps. 
We'll combine those images together using the channel combination tool to get to our first RGB image, which we're looking at now. Now, the color on this is pretty off because the images weren't balanced one to another. Uh, I'm not too worried about that because I'm going to be fixing that in the next step. We're going to use the photometric color calibration tool in order to correct the color that we saw from our original image. This is an amazing tool, uh, which I just love to use. Um, it's a smart tool. It takes your color image, recognizes the stars, does a plate solve so it knows which star is which, looks up in an online database what the actual color of those stars are, uh, compares it to the colors being represented by the image you gave it, creates a regression model between the two, which allows you then to correct with a great deal of accuracy what the color of the individual stars are. The result of this will be an accurate portrayal of the colors of the stars uh, in the sky. I think this is nothing short of magic. And here is our color calibrated version of the RGB image, uh, a dramatic improvement from where we started. Uh, but as I look at it, you can see that there's some subtle color gradients going on. If you look at the outside edges, it looks a little yellow-green, whereas the uh, inside, if anything, looks a little magenta. So we're going to do another run of uh, dynamic background extraction to correct for that. The first step in using the dynamic background extraction tool is to create a sampling plan. And here's a sampling plan I used for this particular image. Basically, I have samples all over the images, trying to avoid the brighter stars, but completely avoiding the nebula itself, since I don't want it to be uh, counted as background. Once you run background extraction, it will create a model of a surface that it thinks is the background, and it will include any gradients, colors, or otherwise. And that is then extracted from the image. Um, the, this is a representation of the background that it's going to be extracting. And you can see that there's some interesting color gradients there. And here is the result of extracting that background, and our color gradient situation is definitely improved. If you zoom in on these images, you can see that there's quite a bit of noise that's there in the background. These are relatively short integration times, so that's to be expected. It probably won't have a big impact because, remember, we're going to extract the stars, and the stars won't have that. But just to keep the star edges clear, I decided to do a noise reduction uh, using the noise exterminator and uh, linear mode with a value of 0 0.5 just to cut things back a bit. And here is the after picture for the noise reduction. It cleans it up nicely. Um, and again, we'll be not using this background, but it will make the edges around the stars a little cleaner. And I'm hoping that will be helpful when we extract those stars. Now it's time to take these images nonlinear. When we did that with the other images, I just used the screen transfer function with the histogram tool to uh, apply the transform. Um, I'm not going to do that here because in those cases, that method can uh, grow and bloat your stars. But since we're going to go starless, I wasn't too concerned about that. In this case, I'm very concerned about that because the stars are what their output product is, and I want them to be the best they can be. So my approach here is to select a good sample preview of some background sky, use the masked stretch tool, to do the first uh, swing into nonlinear space, and then clean that up a little bit with a curves tool just to get the contrast I want. And what we're looking at here is the result of those two tools bringing us into the nonlinear domain. Once I have um, my nonlinear image, I now want to extract the stars. So this is done using StarNet2, uh, choosing the uh, star mask option. After running that, this is the image that's resulting. The background has been dropped out, and all we really have is the color stars. Uh, these can be processed a bit more, and I did do a little bit of tweaking, but it was pretty minor tweaking. These are now ready for the later use of adding back in. Now that we've created our RGB stars, we're ready to take on the final phase. In this final portion, we'll be concentrating on taking our starless luminance image and folding that into the HOO color uh, starless image. 
uh, at that point, we'll be doing the final series of processing, getting that color image ready for the reintroduction of stars. Once we've completed that processing, we will bring the stars back in and we'll end up with our pretty much final image. In this next section, we're going to do some very targeted processing. In order to do that, we're going to have to create a series of masks which will enable that to occur. The first mask is one we've already mentioned, which is the nebula mask. The goal of this mask is to isolate the nebula from the background sky. We'll start the creation of this mask by using the range selection tool in the live preview mode. Adjusting its parameters, we'll try to get the best isolation we can of just the nebula itself. Of course, in doing that, we're going to be capturing some brighter portions of the background sky, but don't worry about that. We're going to be eliminating that in the next step. Since I want this mask to only show the nebula itself, I'll have to edit the results of the uh, range selection tool so that the extraneous bits are taken out. Now, I use the dynamic paintbrush tool, which is a $5 premium tool you can pick up to do this, but you could have used this, uh, the the clone stamp tool as well. But the idea here is just to have the mask covering the nebula. I noticed in the last section that the mask I ended up with really didn't uh, cover the oxygen three lobe that you can see at the top of the nebula. So using the dynamic paintbrush tool, once again, I modified that to make sure that I was including that area. I ensured that I was accurate in how I drew that by overlapping this image with the actual photographic image and comparing the two and making sure that I had uh, the right region selected. As a final step, I wanted to soften this mask up a bit, uh, or especially around the edges. So I used the convolution tool and I applied it several times with a uh, standard deviation of about 10. Uh, until I got the softness that I was looking for. And with that, our mask is now complete. The next mask we need is the Oxygen 3 mask. And the goal here is to have a very detailed mask that covers all the parts of the nebula which are colored by our Oxygen 3 signal. And the goal here is to use this mask so that we can fine tune the color and enhance just those elements of the nebula. To do this, I'm going to start with creating a simple cyan color mask, since cyan is probably the closest to the color of the Oxygen 3. Um, I'm not using the normal built-in color mask tool in this particular case. I'm trying the pixel math scripts created by Bill Blanchin, um, and uh, these seem to work pretty well, and they were very easy to use. So this is the output of the cyan mask pixel mask script. Next, I boosted the signal here a little bit by using the Curves tool just to make sure we had some good definition around the bright areas uh, for Oxygen 3. Finally, I wanted to eliminate the background from the mask, so once again, I used the Dynamic Paintbrush to do that very carefully, and then I applied uh, the Blurring tool from Bill Blashen's uh, uh, pixel mask uh, script collection and that finalized this particular mask. The final mask we're going to deal with is a red mask. There's so much red in this image because of all the hydrogen alpha signal. Um, I wanted some way to isolate that so that I could tweak it directly. We will begin by creating a red color mask again using Bill Blanchin's pixel mask scripts. Now we can add a little bit of a blur using Bill Blanchin's Blur Tool. Once again, I'm going to use the Curves Tool to boost the contrast of the mask a little bit so that we have some uh, strong differentiation across the, the signal areas. And with that, our mask is complete. With our mask complete, we can now begin the final phase of the processing of the image. Going back to our original HOO starless image, we can now fold in the contribution from our luminance channel by using the LRGB combination tool. 
With the luminance information now added to the color image, you can see a lot more detail in the nebula itself. However, something else that I noticed later on was you now see two bright stars on the left side of the image. They were not in the color image originally. Apparently, the luminance signal brought those stars in, and these are going to cause a problem for us later. Adding the luminance image also darkened things beyond where I wanted to take them. So the first thing I do here is a Curves tool to readjust the image for both tone scale and color. Now we can apply our Oxygen 3 mask, and using the Curves tool, we can adjust the color of that particular portion of the nebula. We next apply the red mask and adjust the red curve with the Curves tool. This brings in the color of the background sky and in the nebula itself in a fairly pleasing fashion. With most of our processing complete, now it's time to go back to our stars only image and add those into uh, our starless image. It looks pretty good except for one problem. I can see where those stars, the bright stars, are bloated on the left side. Those bloated stars are not from the RGB star mask because those are quite small and crisp. It's from something that the luminance mask brought in. So we have a problem there. And I also noticed that the noise level in the image was not where I wanted. I decided I could improve this. So I decided to take a step back and do a few things to enhance where we would end up. So we're going to step back um, into the starless version of the image again, and we're going to start by addressing some of the noise issues. The first problem I saw was a little bit of a noise pattern that was happening in the Oxygen uh, 3 shell. And so the first thing I tried to do there is using the Oxygen 3 mask, I did a little bit of convolution just to soften that up a bit. Next, I did a bit of noise reduction using Noise Exterminator once again. Um, that 0 0.65 level, and this is the before picture, and this is the after picture, and it cleaned up quite nicely. Next, I put the nebula filter back in place, and then adjusted um, the nebula region with the curves tool, uh, playing with the red curve and playing with the neutral curve. Next, I inverted the nebula mask and then did a curve tool adjustment of just the background where I darkened it and I brought up the red saturation and I thought that was much more pleasing. Next, I addressed the problem with those two residual bright star images to the left side of the frame. Using the clone stamp tool, I was able to take them out uh, and clean up that area nicely. With that done, it's now time to add our stars back in. And in doing that, I was much pleased with the result. I'm much happier where this image is, and now most of our processing is complete. I took the previous image that we saw, and I shared it with some friends and some colleagues and got their feedback on it. Uh, two points were made, which I thought were kind of interesting. The first was that there was an awful lot of background, and it would probably help a little bit if I could just crop in a little bit tighter. So I did that. The second thing is that I did such a good job in controlling my star sizes that the bright stars didn't have enough impact. So it looked like I was going to have to go back in and for the first time in my life, I would be taking stars and making them brighter and bigger. <laughs> Normally I'm fighting so much to, uh, to eliminate star bloat, that's not an issue here. So I took the image into Photoshop, which I often use to do the final little bits in it. I enhanced the stars, I did the final crop, I did a little bit of tweaking here and there. And then the final thing that I always do with my images, I import my uh, watermark that goes on the lower left side and the title of what the image is, and I put that down as an overlay on the bottom right. And with that, we have our completed image. I hope you like my take on NGC 6888, the Crescent Nebula. Please let me know if this kind of a video walkthrough is a useful thing, especially when backed up with the detailed image processing walkthrough that's on the website. Your feedback is welcome and will help me to evolve this approach. And as always, your comments and questions are welcomed and appreciated, both here on this YouTube channel and on my website. 
I would also ask that you consider subscribing to this channel and ringing the bell. That'll help us get started here, and it'll make sure that you aren't missing new content as it's released. As I mentioned before, I've now processed all of my backlog data. So now I'm looking forward to the next imaging cycle and hopeful that we'll have the right conditions so that I can capture uh, enough data to keep me going for a few more weeks of image processing. And keeping that in mind, I'd like to wish you and myself clear skies and excellent seeing.